Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest lecture. And this is going to be on CT Protocol Design and Optimization 2021. I typically begin every course I run with this lecture because at the end of the day, unless you do the right protocols, unless you know some of the real basics, and not that you don't know it, but unless you think about it, you're just not going to get great studies. And really, when we see bad outside scans from other institutions, it's always related or almost always related to the protocol design. The contrast is injected too early or too late or not enough. The acquisitions are the wrong acquisitions. It's not arterial or venous phase. It's some mishy, mashy, something or other that I don't know what the heck it really is. And we've seen this more and more in this COVID era. Now, it is true that with COVID, Giving oral contrast has been somewhat of a challenge, in part because people are afraid to take masks off, and I understand that. And we're going to come out of the COVID soon, but it's everything that we put together to really optimize the study. And I'd like to discuss that with you, and again, um, let's have this as a conversation. I know you can't answer because I am recording this, but let's try to make it into a conversation. So with that, let's get started. Now, when you look at error rate, people talk about an error rate between 3 and 4% in radiology practice. However, when there is an abnormality present, people talk about an error rate of up to 30%, which is somewhat uh, amazing. When you look at this article by Kim, the errors were both commission and omission. The errors that bother me the most are the errors of under-reading, where you don't see a finding. What I mean by that is if you see a liver mass and you kind of say, well, I think it's hepatoma or some malignancy, and someone else looks and says, well, it's FNH or hepatic adenoma, that's not quite as bad because when you say there's a finding present, someone else is going to look at it and maybe they'll have more thoughts and at the end of the day, the right thing will be done. But very often, if you read the study as normal, no one else is going to go back and look at the study. People tend to assume if you say normal, it's really normal. When you say something positive, they tend to look at it themselves and try to understand it. But it's that normal study that always worries me the most, those errors of under-reading. In this article by McCready, this is more than a decade ago, it's interesting, the false negative CT errors, what were they? unexpected bowel or pancreatic malignancy, incidental PEs, vascular abnormalities, bone lesions, or mental disease, incidental abnormality present on target exams at the periphery of the field of view. That is, you're looking for pancreas, you miss something in kidney. You're looking for kidney, you miss something in pancreas. It's interesting, that's 12 years ago, more than a decade ago, but those same errors are the ones that are with us today. Now, we understand no one is going to be perfect, and even us at Hopkins know no one is going to be perfect. Every once in a while, you know the feeling when you look at a case and you look at the prior films and the finding was missed previously, and then you say, boy, I wonder what idiot missed that. Then you look and it was your name. Then you say, well, it was a really difficult case. But the truth is, error is inevitable. The key thing we're trying to figure out is how can you make errors less frequent? Can you come up with principles that take human interaction and human limitations into account to really allow us to be much more accurate? When people talk about AI, it's not really replacing the radiologist, it's helping the radiologist. Perhaps AI will pick up the tumors you miss accidentally. And remember some of the articles with AI, like in Vercolin, which are the radiologist is 80% accurate, AI is 80% accurate, but together they're 90% accurate. So we really want to get 1 plus 1 equals 3. Now, one of the challenges, of course, is many people, even buying the newest scanners, run them like old scanners. You have to realize you have many different things on your scanner. You have dual energy, you have all sorts of 3D rendering. Now you're seeing more and more of CAD. You think things like texture analysis, so you're going to see a lot of things that are coming along, but there are many things you have already that can really help you in practice. In this article by Morris, the process of achieving value in terms of medical decisioning support does not remove the radiologist, but instead provides easier access to information that might be otherwise inaccessible, inefficient, or difficult to integrate. This becomes very important because 
I gave a talk just a week ago about adrenal masses, and I made the point there are many things I look at in terms of the adrenal lesion, the size, enhancement, presence of fat, presence of calcification, many things I look at, but one of the most important things is the history. If the patient has a known malignancy, you're probably looking at a MET. If the patient's Cushing's has Cushing syndrome and uh, all of a sudden you see adrenal mass, you know it's probably a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. So again, history, but if the history is buried somewhere in the medical record, if it's hard to reach, if it's an outpatient, well, all you have is rule out something, things are indeed going to be more challenging. Now, of course, you don't want to make the solution more painful than the original process you can't spend 20 minutes looking up history. So as Johnny Ivey, who designed the iPhone and iPad said, our goal is to try to bring a calm and simplicity to what are incredibly complex problems so you're not aware really of the solution, right? We need this to be done in the background. Now, certain things you can do already. One of the things we do at Hopkins is a pre-CT checklist and it's really focused on the technologists. What they do is several days before a patient comes for a study, they look at many of the features of the order. Was the order correct? Was the order confusing? Is it a chest? Is it an abdomen? Is it with contrast? Has the patient had an allergy before and they need to be pre-medicated? Is this a very classic study, just simply follow-up lymphoma? Or is it a complicated study where you want to speak to the radiologist for protocoling? And in this easy-to-implement checklist to maximize 3CT throughput, and not only does it improve throughput, but it improves accuracy, but also improves the satisfaction of our patients. You know very well if a patient needs to be premedicated, they need to be premedicated. But you hate to have someone drive an hour, get to the scanner, and you say, oh, you weren't premedicated, or the premedication was wrong, or you didn't take it. Now you got to come back tomorrow or next week. That really frustrates patients, and we really want to try to avoid that at all costs. And so this is a good article by Sheila Sheth, who's now at NYU, and B. Mudge, who is now retired. B. was at Chief Tech for about 40 years. But again, their legacy partly is this article, an easy-to-implement checklist to maximize CT throughput in an outpatient setting that can be customized to the needs of individual institutions and has the potential to improve patient safety and experience. So that indeed is a great thing. And you can see from that article all the things that uh, were impacted by this checklist. So again, it's very important, and it's very important to use it or think of something like that in your own practice. Now, I mentioned at the start of this talk, everything revolves around protocols. And protocols start with contrast, oral, IV, rectal, a uh, contrast place in the bladder, what specifically do you need? Also, when you start designing the protocols, if you're giving contrast, do you do a non-contrast CT? Non-contrast CTs are critical in patients where you're looking or staging or evaluating a renal mass, but you don't need them in pancreas studies and you don't need them in liver studies. The question also then is, when you're giving contrast, how many phases do you need? The less phases, the better, is less dose to the patient. But if you're looking for a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas or metastasis from neuroendocrine tumor, you need arterial phase and you need venous phase. If you're looking at the kidneys for hematuria, you need arterial and venous and delayed phase. Delayed phase becomes critical because that's how you pick up many transitional cell carcinomas. If you're looking at a pancreas mass, delayed phase imaging is really not going to be helpful. Then, of course, when you're giving contrast, what's the injection rate, what's the volume, and what's the timing of acquisition? All those things need to be customized for the individual patient, and that helps you make sure you get the optimal protocol and the optimal information from any individual scan. Then, of course, we want to look at the CT protocol from the KVP to the MAS. We want to get the lowest dose possible, yet still getting a great study. Collimation, we're doing 3D, so we want thin sections, closely spaced. The algorithm will depend on what you're doing. Is it the lung? Is it bone? Is it soft tissue? And in many cases, you'll need two or three algorithms. No, that does not increase the patient dose. It increases the post-processing time. But with the newer scanners where the images are reconstructed so quickly, you can put that in your protocol and it will be done automatically. And that becomes very important. 
Uh, CTSS, many of you use CTSS. We have a quarter of a million followers or more worldwide in over 200 countries. One of the most popular areas still after 22 years is the protocols. We keep trying to update them, but it's a good place to look for your protocols and see specifically what's going on and how you might improve your protocols. And when we see a protocol, this is how it needs to be done. Now, I will tell you, you also need this because when Jayco used to visit pre-COVID, they would ask for a book next to your scanner that had all the protocols. Even though you had it electronically, they wanted it printed. And what did you have to show? So let's take the pancreas. What phases do we use? Well, we use arterial and venous. The other phases aren't important. We talk about when the arterial is and when the venous is. We talk about the distance scanned. We talked about the KVP and MAS. We talk about the collimation. We talk about the various parameters in terms of contrast. What kind of contrast? What's the volume? What's the injection rate? What's the oral contrast? And how much of it do we give? We then talk about the reconstruction. Do we do thick and thins or only thick? Our process is thick and thins typically every time. And you can see here the reconstruction algorithm will indeed vary. The window width and window centers will also vary depending on the specific areas we want to show. Now, even though you have a protocol, one protocol often isn't enough. What I mean by that, if you think about hematuria, hematuria can be in a 20-year-old or an 80-year-old. In an 80-year-old, just by age, they're more likely to have a tumor, be it in the kidney or be it in the bladder. If you have a 20-year-old, there's possibly a stone or infection. So you want to make protocols that are designed to give less dose to younger patients and give less dose to patients who are lower at risk for having a tumor. And things we think about also are microscopic versus macroscopic hematuria. Microscopic hematuria, particularly younger patients, it's unlikely to be a tumor. But macroscopic, even in younger patients, you really have to worry about a tumor. So more, phrase, more phases will be critical to get the right answer. In this article by Ramon, that's us, in patients less than 35 years of age, ostensibly at lower risk for developing renal malignancies, we only acquire non-contrast, arterial, and delayed phase imaging. And the arterial is only through the kidneys, not through the bladder. Because the odds of a patient having either a significant renal parenchymal lesion or other abnormalities is less, and so venous acquisitions are of less value. And that's just a good point how you need to do things. Now, one of the things you need to do, of course, is do the studies correctly to optimize your accuracy. These articles from the ER people are not very helpful. Contrast is unnecessary for most abdominal CTs, written by someone who's never read a single CT scan. Okay, and then saying the reason we give contrast is because we learned it in our residency and the literature disagrees with giving contrast. Listen to this. Have they made an honest effort, that means you and me, to compare results with and without contrast? Probably not. Do they care that oral contrast will add two hours in ED stay and when given probably doesn't help because it doesn't reach the cecum? Neither of those statements is true. We don't wait two hours and you don't need it to reach the cecum to be of value. So we need to give contrast. So then the question becomes, what type of contrast? When you think about oral, what's the volume, what's the timing, and what's the type? We can think of oral contrast as three things. Water as a neutral agent, Omnipeg 350 as a positive agent, and volumen, which is a neutral agent, which is used less frequently now, uh, and we'll speak about that in a moment. And then, of course, we'll talk about IV contrast. When you think about oral contrast, you need to say, when do I need the specific use of each contrast agent? Now, doing nothing, giving nothing. So this was a patient with abdominal pain. Why can't you give oral contrast? Now, I know you don't want to wait a long time, particularly in this COVID era. Just give the patient, since you're not giving IV in this case, give them a cup of contrast, positive contrast, have them drink it. Even if they drink it five minutes before the study, the stomach is opacified and invariably a lot of the proximal small bowel is. Well, this was read by a resident and they read this as negative. And you can see when you look a little bit more carefully, there looks like a large mass. Maybe it's pancreatic or maybe it's coming off the stomach in the left upper quadrant. And yes, you should be able to recognize this on the non-contrast study. But when you're very busy and 
Many of us have residents and fellows looking at cases initially. It's very easy to miss this. Now, when I looked at it, I knew there was something there. We brought the patient back, and there's the mass. It's pushing on the pancreas, coming off the stomach. It's a GIST tumor, okay? GIST tumor, mildly enhancing, exophytic, and there it is in the coronal views. So the patient is having this tumor resected after biopsy. You can see the necrosis in the tumor, but you can see in this case we gave IV contrast and we gave water, and you can see the lesion very well. I know the first time, for whatever reason, they don't want to give IV contrast. I think it may have been a stone study. But the point is, if you gave, if you gave positive oral contrast, I don't like to give water in the face of no IV contrast because it doesn't help much. So I would give positive. You would have seen this tumor. Or this case where they actually gave positive contrast and you can see the large mass in the gastric fundus, which is a GIST tumor, very nicely shown in coronal views. Or this case where the patient had pneumoperitoneum. You want to figure out where the pneumoperitoneum is coming from. So positive oral contrast, oral omnipaque uh, is inert. So if it goes in the peritoneal cavity, it's not going to cause peritonitis. But look how nicely you can see the contrast extravasation and the duodenal ulcer. There's a pneumoperitoneum. There's a duodenal ulcer. You can see precisely where the patient's ulcer is. This patient underwent surgery and this ulcer was uh, oversown. But again, the positive contrast is beautiful in this case, showing you the site of the ulceration and the site of extravasation. Very well done. Now, in terms of CT, there used to be, uh, when I started, everyone was MPO after midnight, though you may not have gotten to them to the early afternoon. That was a terrible thing because you dehydrated the patients, and that's the number one cause for renal problems. So we tell people, drink lots of fluids. Don't eat a big meal in the two to three hours before the study, but drink lots of fluid. And this article by Barbosa makes the point that patients who are fasting actually have more reactions with nausea and vomiting compared to patients who've been uh, who've had fluid or were not NPO. And so these unexpected findings were actually significantly associated with fasting. So fasting actually is hurting our patients. We do not do fasting. There's no doubt about it. Now in terms of positive contrast, some people use barium. Barium is hard to drink. It, it transit time is less than iohexol, but it's thick Unless the patient has a severe allergy to contrast to iodine, you want to use iohexol. Patients like it better three to one, okay? There's no if, ands, or but. And now it's pre-mixed, it's easy to use. And in a COVID era where you don't want to be mixing things or having things sitting around, single dose use is really the best. And here, just to show you, uh, Omnipake, we like the nine milligrams, but it's the same size as my vitamin water zero, which I love very much. And um, simply, you can peel the label off. You don't need to have a label on because the patients often start reading the label. It seems like medicine. You pull the label off, it just looks like a bottle of water, and it tastes very much like a bottle of water. And just to show you, the reason we use the nine milligrams is the same density in the low 200s that we used to have when we would put 1,000 cc's of Omni in a gallon of water. Not 1,000 cc's, 100 cc's of Omni in a gallon of water. So that works out very, very nicely. This 12 milligram goes to above 300. We've not really tried it, but it might be interesting to use it uh, and look at it more carefully. Uh, in this article by Winkhover, frequency of non-uniform opacification of bowel was higher uh, with uh, barium, or oral diatrosate than with iohexol. So again, another reason to use iohexol. The question, of course, is what about giving IV contrast? What about giving oral contrast? Is there some way you don't have to do anything? For some reason, there's this perverse joy in trying to do as little as possible, even though it's hurting the quality of the study. And this is being pushed by the ER. And people have done things like looking at percent body fat, in this article, doing that and looking at bioelectric impedance analysis, this is really making something out of nothing. You're trying to figure out who does or doesn't need oral contrast. Why don't you just give the oral contrast? What's the big problem? I think here you're making more problems, you're taking longer, you're delaying things, and then you may be making the wrong decision after all is done. Again, um, this articles about the use of contrast, 
Again, sticking with iohexol works very nicely because as these articles comment, transit time is faster and there's less artifact and it makes the images more pleasing. Now again, in terms of reaching and visualizing the appendix, I know it could take two to three hours. We don't wait that long. We wait 15 to 30 minutes. It's not going to reach the cecum, but again, the stomach, so much of the small bowel is opacified, it can really help you. And if you're not certain what's going on, since you've already given the contrast, you can bring the patient back in an hour or so and just scan a very limited area. So it's a win-win. There is no downside. Doing nothing has lots of downside. This article by Juan Howey, in conclusion, we believe that cross-sectional imaging aids clinicians in determining the underlying cause of the acute abdomen. While changing our protocol from three to one hour oral consumption has not impacted the radiology interpretation, uh, it has made things faster. But again, uh, people don't have good results in terms of pure accuracy because no one is going to do a study like that. So this lack of oral contrast what does it result in? Misdiagnosis, indeterminate diagnosis, delay in diagnosis, and radiologist stress for no reason. A key thing for getting oral contrast is where you put it. If these premixed bottles are sitting in the pharmacy and you have to call up the pharmacy, it can take hours. That's a problem. It needs to be at the nursing station and the CT scanning area and the PIXIS machines so it can be given quickly and there's no delay. Two people who've made this very clear, Alec Megabo at NYU, our ER physicians do not see that oral contrast administration hampers operational efficiency. They're aware of the serious consequences of missed or incorrect diagnosis and will always choose good medical care over time slashing, corner cutting methods that impress the dashboard monitors, perhaps at the expense of excellence in patient care. Excellent comment from Alec. As stated by J.R. Tata, it is insistence on the relentless attention to detail and assistance on highest standards of quality and performance that are the keys to productivity and efficiency, most certainly not through cutting quarters. You need to give oral contrast. Perry Pickard, a few months back, wrote a similar article. However, for those who believe, as I do, that it can, it can genuinely increase diagnostic confidence and can sometimes rather unpredictably make a major impact on diagnosis, it behooves us to keep fighting for the use of oral contrast. Very well said, Perry. As radiologists, we need to ensure that financially driven non-medical justifications are in the best interests of our patients. And not giving oral contrast to think you're saving time is not one of them. Now, in terms of oral contrast, if you're not giving it, if you're getting into fights, some things you can hold your, your, your guard on, I guess. Suspected post-op bowel leaks, GI fistula, interloop abscesses, oncologic staging, and nonspecific abdominal pain are all good reasons for positive oral contrast material. And you may have to explain to your referring clinicians, but they're not around. Just do it. I think the argument is sort of this nebulous one. So you just need to do it, okay? And again, we'll leave you with this statement by Perry Pickard. So that becomes very, very important. And again, as you're designing protocols, oral contrast is a key part of your protocols. And as I mentioned, even a short prep, 15 minutes, it gives me the stomach and perforation. It gives me occult gastric tumors. It gives me bowel pathology, whether it's duodenum or jejunum. Again, if I need to come back, at least the contrast is on board. Something is better than nothing. So let me just show you another point to make is when you use oral contrast, it does not necessarily mean you're going to be perfect. This was read as negative. I think they read this as unopacified bowel loops. They never had a coronal view. When I did the coronal, you can see this was an obvious mass in the bowel. It was malignancy. So again, oral contrast still requires you to look at the coronal views and still requires you to be careful. Um, intersusception, here's just another example, really nicely showing you an intersusception with a positive contrast in place. So that indeed becomes very important. Um, we have gone through even 3D imaging showing the use of cinematic rendering in patients with positive oral contrast material that it does create high quality images and perhaps it's something we should think about going forward. Here's a nice example of a patient with enteritis, really thick and small bowel on the coronal views. 
uh, this kind of a stack of coins appearance. Here it is on the classic volume rendering, and here it is with cinematic rendering. So the question will be, can cinematic rendering create this new type of small bowel series? That will be kind of interesting. And again, you can see it if I just go forward right here on this video. Uh, you can see really how you can opacify the bowel with positive contrast, and then do the CT scan. The contrast is in colon and small bowel. And because we were using this uh, premix 9%, or 9 milligrams rather, again, it's a very nice visualization without any artifacts. So I think it's very important to do. So that's oral contrast, and that's some of the other principles. Now let's talk about IV contrast. But I've used up more than the time I allotted for oral contrast because I was so passionate about it. So let's take a break, and let's come back in a few minutes. See you soon. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.